Heavenly Father, God, you are a chain breaker. And Lord, that we may have those chains of sin that are binding us. That even if we believe, even if we have given our hearts to you, Father, that sin can creep up. It can, and it can hold us back. And a lot of times we need to be reminded that we're no longer bound to it. We're not. We're free. We really are. And so, Father, as we're here today, Lord, I pray that even though our numbers are small, Lord, that we can band together as a body of Christ, band together and gather strength from one another, that ultimately, Father, you are our source of strength. And we thank you for that. So we just pray that those chains that we have brought in with us will be broken today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 continuing once again with the passage of scripture that's leading up to the cross and that's kind of where we're going of course we have Easter in just a few weeks and it will be at the end of April this year and so we're kind of getting to that point and Jesus right now is going to be speaking with his disciples about something that they don't agree on that they 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 think that uh, those who are doing things in Jesus's name that are not a part of their group are not doing right and Jesus is going to put them in their place and so if you look at Mark chapter 9 verse 38 through 40 we'll read this real quick teacher said John we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. So in 2017, only weeks apart from each other, hurricanes hit Texas, West Louisiana, Florida, and Puerto Rico, and elsewhere with devastating flood and wreckage. Now, thankfully, faith-based disaster relief organizations and Christian volunteers helped provide aid, and the gospel of Christ was at the forefront of their relief efforts. The researcher and author Ed Setzer, who writes for USA Today, this is what he said about this. He says, in a disaster, churches just don't hold bake sales and raise money or collect clothes to send to victims. Faith-based organizations are integral partners in state and federal disaster relief efforts. 
They have specific roles and a sophisticated communication and coordination network to make sure their efforts don't overlap or get in each other's ways. In our world today, we love to see people working together, don't we? We do. I mean, it often seems as if people are too focused on the negative parts of their communities and in the world. So, when we see people getting along and fighting together for a cause, it lifts our spirits. Churches are some of, the, some of those places where this can, this can and should take place. However, despite seeing how often they work together, there also appears to be equally as many times when they don't work together. I remember personally being a part of a church in Oklahoma that was very clo- closed to other church bodies around them. Two years prior to my arrival there as a pastor, they went through a very ugly church split. The remaining group of believers who had split from them set up a church only two blocks away in this town of 600 people. Think about that for a second. Do the math. The tensions were high. <laughs> But as a young minister, I thought that I could come in and bring these two groups back together. And what I found is that some Christians do not want to work with others. It was a very painful couple of years while I was there in that ministry because the two churches fought against each other with silence and contempt. Over the course of a year and a half, I preached at both churches. I was asked to leave the first church because I wanted the unity between the two, and then the other one actually picked me up as their preacher. And I just saw how the bitter the body of Christ could be with one another, and it caused me to leave the ministry for a few years. And when I came back into the ministry years later, I vowed to do everything I could to see the body of Christ work together within and outside of denominations. I did. And as a result, I actually became an American Baptist minister. I was not an American Baptist minister back in those days. And that is one of the main reasons that I became one. And as such, I now have the opportunity to see that happen. It is my personal belief that God does not want denominations to separate believers from the work that they can do together. We have denominations to keep our theology in line with each other, but that doesn't mean that we cannot reach outside of our denominational lines to achieve the greater goal of the ministry, and that is to bring the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone. In our scripture today, I believe that Jesus is showing us that those who are attempting to do that same very thing can be worked with. They can be. And I want to present to you some advice today for when you uh, take the plunge and decide to work with others who are in the faith and those who are not in your denomination. First off, my first point here is that you need to start with what you have in common. Start with what you have in common. Now, I'm going to hit you with some science today. Science behind the pulpit, right? That'll probably shock you, but it's 100% true. Every living creature in the world shares at least 40% of their DNA with one another. Every living creature, from multicellular organisms to single cellular organisms, 40% we share DNA. As humans, we share at least 93% of our DNA with apes and monkeys, 90% with mice, 84% with dogs, and 65% with chickens. Despite how different we are, our genetic code shows some similarities. Now, many scientists get caught up on these similarities that we have with chimpanzees. We share between 98 and 99% of our DNA with those animals. We are very similar, but we are not the same, not even by a long shot. Though we have similarities, the small percentage of DNA difference makes for great changes. Enlarged brains, higher capacity to learn, and dare I say, a conviction of spiritual and unseen things that other animals cannot connect with. They're game-changing physical differences. Also, if you look in the Bible... God put us in charge. And if you don't believe me, read the first two chapters of Genesis. Now churches 
share many similarities. We share similarities with every Christian denomination in the world. Some of our denominations are so closely related in theology that it's nearly impossible to tell them apart. However, those those differences that we do have alter the way we worship, fellowship, and work and evangelize. Those differences can cause unnecessary dissension within the church. So, we meet in denominations so as to limit the number of disagreements that we have. It's a protective measurement. It's not ideal, but it's worked for the last 600 years. Now, you see, God actually hates church dissension. Did you know that? He really does. Listen to the passage of Scripture that we get the seven deadly sins from. All right, This is the classic passage of Scripture we get the seven deadly sins from. And uh, it's Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. Very highlightable verse for you. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, that's six, and here's the seventh, a person who stirs up conflict in a community. It is the last thing that makes all these things detestable because it is the division of a community of believers that leads to other sins. To bring all of this home, the truth that most of us do not want to realize is that the history of American churches is the history of church splits. It is. The history of American churches is the history of church splits, not merges. Coincidentally, this church is one of the few that is actually a product of a merge and not a split. Regardless of that fact, denominations were made to show separations. That's what their design was. But they were not made to keep Christians apart. At least, that wasn't the goal. Now, as we move further into the 21st century, we are moving into a post-Christian age. Sure, many people will claim the name Christian, but they will nullify that by neither believing in God's power or His Word. We are living in an age where believers attach themselves to feelings and not faith. And they certainly don't attach themselves to the Word of God. That's the problem when it comes to gathering everyone together in worship. Someone is going to get their feelings hurt by what is being taught because they're not going to agree. So that brings me to my second point, which is very important. We need to acknowledge that there are some things that should separate us from other denominations. There are. I have a very simple question for you. Why don't you see Protestants and Catholics worshiping with each other on a regular basis? Why don't we share the same churches? Sure, there are some that do to worship together, but on a regular basis. We both believe in the same God. We even believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He died for our sins. I've heard many people say that if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again for our sins, then there should be no reason why you shouldn't be able to worship together. Well, Catholics believe that, so why don't we worship with them? Well, the answer is actually really simple. There are some things that make different views and denominations so separate from each other that they cannot be harmonized. They can't be. Simply put, the Catholic faith has additions to their practices that we in the Protestant churches do not see as part of the Christian faith. Such practices as the holy sacraments, the prayers to the saints, and the almost deified position of Mary create divisions that cannot be agreed upon. Okay, And not without a clean conscience, at least. And when it comes to ecumenism, okay, ecumenism is the practice of bringing different denominations and faiths together for worship and service. No one does it like the Baptists. Honestly, we kind of wrote the book on it, really. However, even we have limits to who we're going to allow to teach behind our pulpits. We're taking communion today. We are. And it's an open table. 
But if you come to the Lord's table and you do not confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died for your sins, that's it. Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died for your sins. Even some Catholics believe that, and Catholics believe that. But if you do not confess that, then you cannot share communion with us. You shouldn't share communion with us because you're not part of the body of Christ. And I know that sounds really mean, but it's right in the Scriptures. It's right there. There are some things that simply agreeing to disagree with will not work. And if that sounds mean and intolerant, just know that I wasn't the one who stated it first. The Bible did. Read Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I am astonished, it says, that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Oh, that's awfully mean. My goodness, Jason, that's so mean. Have you ever thought that the reason why the Bible is so hard on people who believe something other than the truth is because God loves them and wants to see them with Him? You ever thought that? I mean, if you're a parent and you tell your child to look both ways when crossing the street and they just ignore you and walk across the street without looking and almost get hit by a car, what is going to be your response? Well, first, you're going to hug them and tell them that you love them and they're glad that you're safe. And then, oh, then, they're going to get in a lot of trouble. And that trouble can come in many different forms depending on your parenting strategies. Think about it for a second. You rightly should do that. We have rules to protect our children, and God set down rules for us to ensure that we would be safe from hellfire. If that isn't love, I don't know what is. And with all this said, we need to ensure that we are not dragged away and enticed by other types of doctrines. There are so many preachers out there who speak wonderfully and eloquently, and they have sermons that sound so sweet to the ears that they make you feel as if you could just fly right out of the service on a cloud. You live feeling good about yourself, and that keeps you coming back for more. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Uh, It's a good feeling. That means it's good, right? Well, according to the Bible, you just got your ears tickled. That's what it says. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 4. Preach the Word. Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Now, we can worship with people who have different beliefs, But we must be on guard that we are not led astray on things called salvation issues. Such doctrines as the atonement, the resurrection, free will, original sin, these are all points of contention that cannot be taken lightly. However, I think that we all will be surprised in the end when we go to heaven and we see who else is there. And believe me, it's not going to be all Baptists. It won't be. Because here's the thing, in the end, we can all serve together with the same goal. We can serve together with the same goal. Now the rise of civilization occurred because people discovered that they needed one another. Even from the earliest records, people were banding together to make that which is impossible to do alone possible. The Tower of Babel, for instance, was when mankind banded together and their bond was so strong that God had to jumble up their language so that they could come to the realization that their place in this world is as mortals and not immortals. As history marched on, the society 
of the globe moved from being agrarian to being commerce driven. Classes were established and those who had much were separated to those who had little. And what is amazing is that history tells us that many of the ancient civilizations did very little to support the poor. That was until the Hebrews and the Christians came in. Jewish and Christian benevolence began what we know as philanthropy, or as they used to call it, almsgiving. The great Greek philosopher Aristotle actually told people that the poor were poor for a reason and should not be helped. And that was the Greek and Roman ideal of the day, and the Christians crushed that in a huge way. Listen to a very fundamental teaching in the Old Testament. Leviticus 23, 22 says this, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. Even during the brutal and bloody Old Testament, God was telling his people to help others, even foreigners who are not a part of the Jewish nation. Now, listen to what it says in the New Testament. Luke 14, 12 through 14. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brother or sister, or your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back so that you will be repaid. But... When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Ah. As Jesus is saying this, he is talking to those who are following him. These are men who are coming from all different walks of life and philosophical beliefs. They're simple fishermen, a rich tax collector, a few political activists, and at least one nefarious liar in the group. And yet, they're called to work together to help one another. What is our excuse as Christians? Really, what is our excuse? We really don't have one. Baptists, Methodists, Pentecostals, Lutherans, and yes, even Catholics can come together and serve others under the goal of showing Jesus Christ. They can. And that single goal is what unites Christian service in a community. And dare I say, I believe that it is the key to breaking down denominational barriers that keep churches apart. If you claim Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are welcome to serve Him with us. And I would hope that you feel the same. Now, today is communion. And we're going to do it a little bit differently today because since we don't have many people in service, what we're going to do is we'll have the ushers come forward and all that. But... When we have the time where the ushers usually take out for the emblems and all that, you can just come forward and take them. Okay? You can just come forward and take them. And uh, you can just take them back to your seat and you can sit up here near the front. That would be perfectly fine. You see, we as believers are given the opportunity to take communion with one another to show that we are together in our faith. All right, And we have an open communion that if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that He died for your sins, that you are able to take communion with us. You are a part of us. And that belief, my friends, can do all sorts of amazing things. It can lead to incredible stuff. Because when you truly believe that, that will move over into your actions. And you will start to show it in what you do. You will be, as the Bible says, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed by your faith. And that right here is what we celebrate when we take communion. We celebrate what we believe. So let us go together in prayer as we uh, prepare for communion this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you 
we thank you for your son Jesus Christ coming and dying for our, for our sins. And Lord, as we come and we approach this communion table this morning, we're all going to approach it physically. It's such a neat thing to do. Lord, to stand up and to walk forward with a group. To say that we're all together in one mind. We're all together in one sound accord. Father God, I thank you for this. And Father God, I just pray for this time that it will be a blessing as we remember the sacrifice of your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us, please, and let's sing just a stanza, a single stanza of um, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. things out that I'm just going through the scriptures and I'm leading up to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as I'm kind of teaching you about Jesus's life and lo and behold we stop right on this section that just fits so perfectly with what's going on with this church today. Uh, my wife and I have been working on a project that we're trying to get into the community uh, involved and what it will do is it will actually provide shelter, extra emergency shelter for people. And not, not just within this church, but in the entirety of Quincy. And it would be the public providing shelter. It's going very well up in Chicago area. The model is working great. And it's something that we are fighting for here. And so... Believe it or not, I'm working with Lutheran churches, Methodist churches, I'm working with another with a Southern Baptist church, and all of us want the same goal. We want Jesus Christ to be exalted through this. And it's going to work out. I truly believe that it will. And what's amazing about it is that when you open it up to people and you say, hey, let's serve for the same purpose, Believe it or not, people want to do it. They've been wanting to do it. They just needed somebody to, quote-unquote, pull the trigger. And that's what we did. And so, big things are happening here. And I know that this church is supporting us, and we are very, very grateful for that. We are blessed to be here. Constance and I and our family, we love Quincy. And we hate to see the condition that Quincy has gotten into especially with the homeless population because we think it's unnecessary we think that we can help as churches and not just stand beside so that's what we're doing and so i would invite you also to be praying about it to be if you want to volunteer um we're going to be opening it up tonight if you want to volunteer tonight come at seven o'clock We'll be opening things up at 8 o'clock, and we'll basically be doing it all night. You don't have to go the entire evening. You don't. If you want to, hey, that'd be fine. We'll probably hang out and, and uh, chat and everything like that. Believe it or not, last time we did it, we actually played cards. 
um, in a church of all places, right? But still, I mean, it was good. It was good fellowship. It was actually very enriching to people. And so this is something that I believe that we can do together as a church and as a body of Christ. And so let's go ahead and pray as uh, we are dismissed. Heavenly Father, what a wonderful service. And really, we want to work together as churches. We may not agree everything um, doctrinally, but Lord, we agree that your Son is the source of our salvation in our life. We agree with that. And may that be our binding focus, the very thing that we work together with. Father, that wants, we want people to come to you. We want people to come to Christ. We know that he is the only way for salvation. So, Father God, we just pray right now that you would just guide us in all of this. Thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us the conviction and helping us to work together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.